<clears throat> okay, so do you guys have your homework, your sea urchin homework? Yeah. I'll come around and pick that up if you have it. If you don't have it, make sure you get that to me next week. So your midterm exam is coming up. It's not next Monday, but it is the following Monday. So midterm exam. So on next Monday, I'm going to hand out a review sheet. We'll also have a quiz on Monday, our last quiz before the midterm. And if you didn't give me your lab notebook, you need to make sure that you do that. Okay, did I get all the homework? For now. Okay. So we are talking about the vertebrates. So we moved um, into a group a classification that we are found in. And so you'll notice here that we have lung or lung derivatives. And then branching off of this, we have the bony fish. This is my low fin fish. This is my lung fish. So what is this lung or lung derivative? What do you think that is? They have lungs that they have. So they have, what do they use to create buoyancy? What did we see in the perch when we dissected it? Swim bladder. So the lung derivative would be, this would be the swim bladder. So it could be modified into a lung, and it is then so in the lung fish, which remember, are not the walking catfish, but the lung fish are actually able to completely dry out and breathe air. Also notice that they have the low fins, right? And then we see limbs with digits. So these would be the tetrapods. And so we're going to talk about the amphibians, the reptiles, and the mammals. So what, what classification seems to be left out here? Amphibians, reptiles, and mammals. What's the other major group of animals that we think about? What? Not humans, we're mammal. What? Avians. Birds. Avians, right? So you're like, well, where the heck are the birds? Well, they have reclassified birds and they are considered now to be reptiles. So they are just a subgroup of reptilia. So they are actually in the same group of reptiles. So when we talk about the evolution of birds, that would be um, a type of, of the reptilia. Yes. <laughs> okay, so the first group of tetrapods that we're going to talk about are amphibians. And remember that amphibians are actually the first vertebrates to colonize land. What were the first invertebrates to colonize land? Anybody remember? Dragonflies. Dragonflies, which are insects, right? So arthropods, class insecta, um, those, the insects were the first invertebrates to colonize land. And so if you think about it, amphibians could enter into this environment and they could prosper and they could um, undergo adaptive radiation and evolve to fill different types of niches. And so when we look at the amphibians, these are the frogs, the toads, the lizards, not the lizards, sorry, uh, the Sicilians, oops, spelled that wrong, Sicilians, and the salamanders. So I don't think I've ever seen a Sicilian, 
but this is actually a legless amphibian. So like a snake, the Sicilians evolved from an ancestor that had legs. And so not only do we see the evolution of like new structures, but sometimes we see the loss of structures. So the Sicilians being legless is actually an example of a derived trait because they evolved from an ancestor that did have legs. And so if we look at some examples of these, this is actually a fossil amphibian, kind of like it's a little bit more advanced than tectalic because you can see that it has the um, limbs that would allow it to move easily onto land. But the amphibians, um, there was an age of amphibians. So at one point in time in the fossil record, we only see amphibians. We do not see reptiles. We do not see mammals or birds. And so the amphibians actually took and kind of were very diverse in the age of amphibians. And sometimes they actually got to be quite large. So this is an example of some, exa of some types of amphibians. So this is, would be a salamander. This is a frog and this is its tadpole. So in some cases of um, rainforest frogs, they transport their tadpoles from one um, little place with water in it, one little moisture cup that is up in the trees to another. And so then this would be the example of the Sicilian. So if I saw this, I would either think it was maybe a worm, segmented worm, or I might think that it is a snake. This is the largest amphibian. So at one point in time, we had large amphibians, but this is the one that is found today, and this is in China. So this is the largest amphibian that we have around today. So if we look at the characteristics of amphibians, obviously they are tetrapods, as are all the ones that we're gonna talk about from here on out except I guess the Sicilians that have lost their legs, but they have um, scale-less skin. So they do not have scales. And so they have thin, moist skin that aids in respiration in some of them. So they can actually breathe through their skin. They also have shellless eggs. So you probably have all seen amphibian leg eggs, like toad eggs or frog eggs. Toad eggs you can sometimes distinguish from frog eggs. Frog eggs are typically laid in a big mass. Toad eggs kind of look like a chain of pearls. So they're like one chain long of eggs that are laid. But the thing about those eggs is, is that you can see right through them. So they are transparent. So if we were to look at the eggs, you can see that this would be frog reproduction. And they have what is referred to as external fertilization. So the vast majority of them, there's only a few that have internal. And this along with the fact that they have shellless eggs means that they must return to water to reproduce. So this is a constraint, right? A big constraint if you want to be truly terrestrial. Let me spell constraint better. I think that's how you spell it. So that constrains them from moving, it prevents them from moving to new environments um, that might not have water available for reproduction. Toads are probably the most um, terrestrial in terms of they can live in deserts, but they rely upon spring um, seasonal rains. And then once it rains, they come kind of come up out of the mud and they rush to reproduce. And then there's just a limited amount of time in which their tadpoles have to develop to become terrestrial. So they have the, the tadpole stage. So these are um, the tadpoles. 
And notice that they have that um, uh, long tail that they use um, for movement, for locomotion. And they also have gills. And then the tail just simply starts to move or to, to decrease in size, and the legs become larger. Are there any questions about frogs and amphibians? Like something you've always wanted to know. Okay. So how do you think that they um, protect their eggs from, ex from excessive light? How do we protect our bodies from excessive ultraviolet radiation, so sunlight? How do we protect our bodies so that we do not um, get skin cancer? Well, we use sunscreen. But what do we do if we don't have sunscreen on? We get tan, right? And so we get dark, so we produce melanin. So if you look at these eggs, they actually have a little shade of melanin. And so these, they actually will rotate so that they'll, they'll keep the, the developing embryo in shade because excessive ultraviolet radiation can cause genetic mutations, which will cause the eggs to not develop. And so that's why they have that dark covering um, in the egg is to protect against UV radiation. So how do you think amphibians protect themselves from predation, or some amphibians? So can you think about anything that's interesting about amphibians that would, like, you would prevent you from, like, wanting to touch them, or in the case of toads, catch them and eat them, toad legs, right? Poison. Poison, right? And so some have poisonous skin glands. And so most notably of these are the colorful frogs in the tropics, right? So if you go on vacation in the tropics, if you see like a green frog that blends in perfectly with its environment, generally it is safe to pick up that frog. So like if you wanted to pick up a tree frog, those beautiful green frogs with the red eyes, right? That would be okay. They use another defense mechanism, which is they try to blend in. But you don't want to go around picking up the bright blue or the bright red frogs because they actually have skin glands that produce poison. And that is actually a warning signal to predators to prevent them from eating them, right? So predators know, in some cases, not to eat the, um, not to eat the colorful frogs. Now, we actually have a really poisonous um, uh, amphibian in Oregon, and it's called the rough-skinned newt. And I forgot to a picture of that one. So here's many pictures. Let's pick one. How about this one? Okay. So the Rexigan do, do not live in eastern Oregon, but they live in western Oregon, kind of near the Cascade Range, um, in mountain ponds and such. And so these actually are probably the most um, poisonous amphibians and maybe even the most poisonous animal. So if you like licked them and you took in some uh, skin secretions, you could die, right? And there's a story about how um, some hunters were found, three hunters were found dead after they had boiled a rough skin newt in their coffee pot. And so the question was, did somebody just try to play a trick? Were they getting the water out of the, out of the pond and a newt happened to get in there? How did the newt get into their coffee that it killed them, right? And so you wanna be a little bit careful. Well, you wanna be extremely careful. The reason why these guys are so um, venomous is, is that they have co-evolved with garter snakes. And so garter snakes have evolved the ability to eat them, but the toxin can make them ill. And so um, this toxin is to prevent um, them from being eaten, even though they look um, like they, um, they don't, they're not brightly colored except for the yellow underbelly. Okay. Okay. 
So since the age of amphibians, we have seen a, a dramatic decline in amphibians, and recently that has declined even more. So you might have heard that we're in what a period called the sixth major extinction. And um, so amphibians have been particularly hard hit because of a couple of things. One is, is that we have habitat loss. All right, so the destruction of wetlands. So the filling in of wetlands to build structures um, is probably a major reason for their habitat loss. The destruction of the rainforest, right? Decline in amphibians. The other thing is, is that they are susceptible to chemicals. in their environments. And the one reason for this is, is that, for example, they have a shellless egg, right? They have a larval stage that is aquatic. Right? And they have thin skin, so they can absorb substances right across the surface of their skin. So in, in conservation biology, we call um, amphibians and other species that are very susceptible to changes in their environment, indicator species. So if they're present, so like if you go to a pond and you see amphibians, you can be relatively assured that there's not a lot of bad chemicals in the water, right? So it's probably pretty safe if you wanted to go swimming, right? So they're kind of, they indicate to you that, it, the, uh, that the um, ecosystem is healthy, right? And when they're not present, that can also sometimes signal, or if they're present one year and then all of a sudden they're not present, that can signal that something has changed in the environment. So they're kind of like the canary in um, the mine shaft. They're the indicator species in aquatic environments. Okay. So um, you might have heard a few years ago that there was children in Minnesota, for example, that were coming home and they had deformed frogs, right? And this caused a lot of concern by the parents because if their kids are swimming in ponds and they're bringing home these deformed frogs, they're like, what is bad in the, in the, um, in the environment? Well, what they discovered is, is that these frogs were actually parasitized with flukes. So flukes are flatworms. They're in the phylum platyhelminthes. We have liver flukes that could parasitize us, right? We talked about the fluke that went from a, um, a cow to a snail to an ant. So this is just another example of parasitism. But in this particular instance, if the parasit parasite becomes too um, extensive, so they have too many parasites, um, then the um, development goes awry. And so you get frogs that are missing legs and frogs with extra legs. So you get skeletal deformities. So this caused skeletal deformities. So it actually was not a chemical in the environment that caused it, but they believe that the frogs are stressed or the frogs were stressed. And the immune system could not fight off the parasites. So it could be stress, um, maybe extra temperature, warm, <coughs> the pond gets too hot in the summertime. It could possibly be too much nutrients in the water. So that is what caused the skeletal deformities. But there is evidence that some um, amphibians and actually also some reptiles are developing um, or not developing appropriately 
in because of the presence of chemicals in the waters like the herbicide atrazine. So atrazine is a chemical that is commonly applied maybe to fields or to um, areas around streams, and then it gets into the stream. So a herbicide is something that kills herbaceous weeds, right? So not grass and weeds, grass and herbs are a little bit different. And so what atrazine does is it is an estrogen mimic. So there's lots of other things that mimic estrogen as well including hops that they put into beer to, um, to preserve it. So this, the bitter taste in, in a lot of beers is the presence of hops that was used to preserve it. But atrazine is an estrogen mimic and it actually causes um, male frogs to not develop properly. because this is essentially a female hormone that is in the water. So specifically, their testes do not develop. So the testes are underdeveloped. And their larynx, does anybody know or can tell me what the larynx is? So it is right here. So what do we use it for? Speaking, right? So it's your voice box. So why might it be very bad if a male frog has an underdeveloped larynx? Yeah. They can't send out the mating call. So the calls that you hear with frogs, they're mating, they're calling a specific call. It's a specific frequency, right, high or low. If you listen to them, you can tell the differences. And so what happens is, is that it causes um, the demasculinization of larynges, right? And they also have a decrease in testosterone. And so this chemical getting in the water is kind of a signal. It's an indicator, right? that there's bad chemicals in the water and that this could also possibly affect even human fertility, right? If we have all these chemicals that we're getting into the water that cannot be filtered out by uh, means like when we, we actually in Pendleton get our water from the river, right? The underground river, they kind of pump it up from underground, but it's essentially river water and they have to put it through a purification process. But if these chemicals are not coming out, that means you're drinking it, right? And so that could affect um, our reproductive development as well. Okay. So the next major chordate group um, or chordate classification are what are called the amniotes. The amniotes. And this is the amniotic egg. So this is shelled. This also is fluid filled. And so we have what is called the amnion. So this is a fluid filled sac where development takes place. So even in us, we have an amnion, we have an amniotic sac, and it ruptures before we're born, right? And all the water kind of comes out, and then we're born shortly thereafter, like within 24 hours generally, they want you out of the womb once the amnion has been ruptured, the amniotic sac. But the thing is, is, is that we still require development in an aquatic environment, right? So this is still aquatic. But then we no longer have to do it outside, like in a water, body of water. Um, so that this means that we can become more terrestrial, right? So this is an adaptation to a terrestrial lifestyle.
You do not have to return to the water to reproduce. Now there's other things in the amniotic egg besides the amnion. So we have the yolk. And the yolk is food, it's nutrients, okay? And it's kind of interesting, the reason why it's yellow is as that it contains a vitamin called beta carotene, which is a B vitamin, which actually aids in um, preventing um, oxidation, so it's actually an antioxidant. And so the more yellow the yolk, actually the more better is for the developing embryo um, because um, it protects the embryo from damages um, produced by metabolism, chemicals produced by metabolism. Okay. We also have the chorion, and this is used kind of for respiration. So it's a membrane through which they respire. And then we have the elantois. which is the disposal of waste. So it's waste storage. Because if you think about it, in a chicken that's developing an egg, it's producing waste, nitrogenous waste, and this needs to be put somewhere, so it's a produce, put in that part of the egg. So if we look at a diagram from your book, it looks like this. So this is my embryo, right here, and then it is surrounded by the amnion, and then we have the yolk, and then we have the chorion actually goes all the way around, and the lantois is just this part right here. Okay. So also notice that there's a little air sac right here. And so I'm gonna show you a little video about um, what happens inside of the egg. Um, what has to happen inside of the egg and how, um, so we're gonna kind of jump to birds because this is, could be a bird um, egg. And how specifically they are able to get oxygen. Look inside this incubator. These eggs were laid 21 days ago. And this one is just about to hatch. If you listen, you can hear the chick pecking at the inside of its shell. Soon it will break through and take its first breath of fresh air. It's a dramatic moment, that first breath, one shared by so many creatures, including us. But hold on, think about this. When you were in the room, you got oxygen from your mother through your umbilical. But for the last 21 days, this chick has been cut off from its mother, sealed inside an egg. So how does it get oxygen? An egg seems like a perfectly self-contained system. The yolk and the white contain all the nutrients you need to build a baby chick. As with a human baby, all this construction requires oxygen, and that's the one thing that isn't stored inside the egg. So where does it come from? Well, take a look at this. When you magnify an egg shell a thousand times, you can see the calcium carbonate crystals that make up the shell, and here and there, tiny holes one thousandth of an inch across. And these tiny holes let outside air filter in. So oxygen can pass through the shell, but the chick growing inside doesn't have working lungs yet. How does it get that oxygen into its bloodstream? Well, a few days after an egg is laid, something amazing happens. When you hold the fertilized egg up in front of a bright light, you can see it, a delicate network of blood vessels that grows out of the embryo's abdomen and presses up against a membrane just inside the shell. Oxygen from the air comes in through the tiny holes in the shell and then diffuses into the embryo's blood, and the growing chick gets rid of carbon dioxide at the same time. It all looks remarkably similar to your early days in the womb. There was a yolk sac, at least at first, and a network of blood vessels growing out from the place where your belly button now is. But instead of pressing up against the edge of the shell, your blood vessels reach the wall of the womb where they join with an outer membrane to form the placenta. In the placenta, oxygen from your mother diffused into your bloodstream. 
It really is an exact mirror of what's going on in the eggs of birds and reptiles. While all this is happening, lungs are developing. We humans don't fill those lungs with air until after we're born, but chicks get a head start. That's because the whole time oxygen is coming in through the shell, moisture is slowly evaporating out. That creates an empty space that gradually fills with air. A day or so before the chick is ready to hatch, it starts to move. It punctures that air pocket and fills its lungs. It then has just enough oxygen to battle out of the egg and take its first breath of fresh air. This is Skunk Bear, NPR's science show. Please subscribe to our channel and check out our other videos. Okay. So the embryonic portion of the um, placenta in us is called the chorion. So the chorion um, would be homologous in a bird compared to a mammal that has a placental mammal specifically like us that uses the placenta to exchange um, oxygens and nutrients with the maternal circulation. So this is a terrestrial egg. So how do um, sea turtles, for example, when they live in the sea, how do they lay their eggs? Do they lay them in the ocean? They actually have to leave the ocean. So turtles are amniotes, and they actually have to leave the water in order to reproduce. So they have to come back onto land, which is very dangerous for them. Right? And then they lay their eggs on the beach, and then they swim back, and then the turtle hatchlings hatch out, and they scurry as fast as they can to the water before being eaten. Seems like it would be better for them to reproduce in the water, but they are constrained by the fact that they have the amniotic egg. Their ancestors were land animals, and the amniotic egg has to be breathed, right? It has to get oxygen from the atmosphere in order to get oxygen um, to the embryo. Are there any questions about that idea? Okay. So the first group of amnio amniotes is the reptiles. And so I'm gonna put that this includes birds. Okay. Birds evolved from a reptilian ancestor, but that rep the reptiles evolved first. So we, we would say that the reptiles gave rise to the birds. So they have scales. They have a shelled egg. They typically have internal fertilization. So that means that the males have a penis that they insert into the female's reproductive tract to deliver the sperm. So they don't just dump their sperm into or out of the, onto the land. So they have internal fertilization. And uh, reptiles are kind of interesting, specifically like snakes and lizards, because they actually have a penis that is forked. So it has two prongs, and then the female's reproductive tract also has two openings. And so the penis is put in there, um, and I'm not sure why they have that specific adaptation to their penis, but it's just kind of something that's interesting about reptiles. So this includes lizards, snakes, turtles, alligators, and crocodiles, as well as birds. And obviously, snakes, like Sicilians, are tetrapods that have lost, subsequently, have lost their appendages. So there must have been maybe an advantage to being able to move underground in their burrows, or maybe they can move really fast, slithering, different niche. So even aquatic turtles, are reptiles, some people get that confused because they're aquatic, so they must be amphibians, but no, turtles are all um, reptilians. Okay. So let's talk about birds. So birds have some unique characteristics. Obviously, they have a wing. 
And we would say that this is homologous to the forelimb of other tetrapods. They have feathers. These are modified scales. The typical bird also has a beak, or in the case of uh, aquatic, maybe a bill like a duck, right? And this is used in feeding, but they lack teeth. So if they evolved from a reptilian ancestor, they must have gotten rid of their teeth. So you don't see like, when you open up a bird's mouth and it's bill, it doesn't have teeth on it, although we see that there can be some hardening of that structure, but they don't generally chew their food. And so many birds have a gizzard. So they use a gizzard to grind their food. Some birds need to have stones available to them, like if you're raising them. So they actually uh, uh, eat rocks and that actually goes into the gizzard and that, that helps to also grind up their food. So they don't have teeth in their gizzard, but if they ingest rocks, um, they can use those for helping to grind their food. If we look at a um, organism that um, is an intermediate between um, reptiles and birds. This is a transitional fossil called Archaeopteryx. So this is a transitional fossil. So these were around at one point in time. We do not see them today, but they seem to be um, have some reptile characteristics. So if we look at their reptile characteristics, These guys have teeth. They also um, have um, claws at the ends of their wings. They also have vertebrae into their tails. The birds that we see today that have long tails, like scissors tail flycatchers down south, can have these really long tails, right? And those are actually just feathers. So their vertebrae stop, and then the, their tails are just composed of feathers. And so modern day birds have lost the vertebrae extending into their tails. So if we look at what Archaeopteryx looks like, It would look something like this. So this is an artist's rendition of the fossil. There's lots of cool pictures online of the actual fossils. And you can actually see the feathers it being fossilized. So um, here's the feathers. You can see the claws on the end of the wings. And then they also have a tooth beak, which we do not see in modern day birds. So birds are kind of like living dinosaurs, if you hear them called that. So if we look at the dinosaurs and the lineage of dinosaurs, I know this is kind of small. We have, I don't know if you're, if you're a dinosaur freak, you know, you might know some of these, not dinosaur freak. I meant to say, if you're a fan of dinosaurs, like Tyrannosaurus, right? Everybody knows that one. What is this one? Oviraptorosaurus. Um, anyway, so the birds are believed to be a, um, so we, when we say that dinosaurs have gone extinct, well, except for the birds. So birds are actually considered living dinosaurs, modern day birds. Okay, some other interesting things about birds that um, are flight related, but seem to be flight related, is, is that um, most birds lack a penis.
So um, the exception to this is our ducks and geese and swans, except ducks, geese, and swans. But they still have internal fertilization. So when we look at the reproductive structures of birds, oftentimes it's impossible to tell whether a bird is male or female if the, if the sexes do not look different. So sometimes like in raptors, like eagles, it's sometimes really hard to tell whether it's a male eagle or a female eagle. And so um, the reason for this is, is that they have a common opening called a cloaca. So the cloaca is the common opening to the digestive, urinary, and reproductive systems. And cloaca technically means sewer, but that is kind of a kind of name. Anyway, so their digestive waste comes out with their urinary waste. So when you see bird feces, sometimes you see white. The white part is their, like their uh, uric acid, which is the same thing as our urea in our urine. So they're digestive, and so when they, uh, when they poop, they're actually peeing at the same time. So the reproductive system is that same opening. And so birds typically have a mating behavior that is referred to as the cloacal kiss. And this is where they just touch their cloaca, their openings together, and the sperm automatically somehow, without being inserted, it swims. It's kind of a weird thing, but it just swims into that opening and then makes its way to the egg. So it seems like a really inefficient way of reproducing, but that might be because maybe a long or a structure as a penis might be detrimental if you're flying. I don't know if it has a, a, a basis in flight. The other interesting thing about birds is, is that females have only one ovary. So that also might have to do with being lighter. I don't know, the, I, the hypothesis is, is that maybe the elimination, you only really need one ovary to produce eggs. So that elimination of that second ovary might help with flight. And their bones are very porous and light. So they're actually kind of easy to break. But this aids in flight. OK, so if we look at some pictures, this is a cloaca. That's the common opening to the digestive system, the reproductive system, and the urinary system. You might see this happening um, because springtime is the time for birds to perch on trees and wires. And so this is the cloacal kiss with swallows. And so this would be the male and the female. They just touch their cloaca together, and that is how they mate. So there's always an extreme in biology, it seems. And so when we look at ducks, there is an Argent Argentinian duck that has the longest penis. And it is actually shaped like a corkscrew. And so this is a duck um, very long uh, relative to its body size, right? And it actually fits into the female's reproductive tract, which is also corkscrew shaped. And so the thing about um, uh, lacking a penis or, or having a penis is the difference between being able to force copulation. So sometimes um, when you're at duck ponds, you see males jumping on top of females and then pushing them under the water. And sometimes like they'll lose all their feathers on the back of their neck. And oftentimes um, sex can be kind of aggressive in ducks, but at other birds it really can't because if the male lacks a penis, he can't really force copulation. There's no way to do that. And so um, it's kind of an interesting example 
of kind of the differences in mating behaviors between species based upon the presence of a penis or not. Okay, last group. This is the group that we are in, the mammals. So why do you think it's called mammals? What, what is the reference there to? Mammary glands, right? So these produce milk. These are actually believed to be modified sweat glands. And the reason why we believe that they're modified sweat glands is we're gonna look at the primitive mammals that actually just sweat milk on their bellies. And so they actually don't have nipples. Okay. Do you guys wanna share? Okay. <laughs> we have hair, okay? These are modified scales. Mammals evolved from reptiles. Mammals are also endothermic. And I didn't mention this with birds, but they are also endothermic. And could be that some of the dinosaurs were also endothermic as well. We don't really know. It's not something that would fossilize really well. Um, there are certain traits that are associated with endothermy as like, for example, the circulatory system. But this means that they use metabolism to regulate their body temperature. So part of the energy that I eat every day goes to just maintaining my body temperature whether or not I'm trying to get warmer or cooler, I need to stay relatively 98.6. And the interesting thing is, is that if we are even just a, like um, a few degrees off, like if you're like 101, you can really feel the difference, right? Um, so just minor fluctuations in our temperature um, can have dramatic effects, right? And similarly, minor fluctuations in the Earth's temperature can also lead to dramatic effects. So we help to, that helps to regulate our body temperature. So this is as opposed to organisms that are ectothermic. And this means that they don't use metabolism. So they don't use food per se, but they doesn't mean that they are cold blooded. So if you were to measure the body temperature of a snake on a rock, a hot rock in the middle of the day, it would be hot blooded, right? It just means that they don't use their metabolism. They um, can thermoregulate by moving in the environment. So can adjust by behavioral or behavior or movement in the environment. And that's what a lot of insects do, right? Sometimes on, in the morning you might see the butterflies or the dragonflies and they're out there with their wings like this. They're getting warmed up so that they can become more active. Okay, so we have a group of mammals that um, is, has some very primitive, what we call primitive characteristics because they are believed to be more ancestral. And these are called the monotremes. So there's only two major groups of monotremes. We do not have monotremes in North America. So these are the duck-billed platypus. and the spiny echidna. These are not marsupials, they are monotremes. 
And they're monotremes because they lay eggs. They also lack nipples, which means that they sweat milk. So that's probably not a very efficient way of transferring nutrients, but the babies just seem to lap it up, you know, lick it up. Uh, nipples, it, that's a very good adaptation because it provides efficient transfer of um, uh, milk from the mother to the baby, but we don't see that in monotremes. So I'm going to show you a little um, video of monotremes. And I'm hoping it'll play right without too much. The platypus and Nikita are the only two survivors of a group of mammals called the monotremes. Trace their genetic line back, and we discover they split from all other mammals around 200 million years ago. Because they retain traits from that distant time, they give us a remarkable insight into very early mammals like Haprocodium. The most extraordinary feature of all is one that no other modern mammal has retained. They lay eggs. This echidna egg is tiny, only about the size of a marble. The hatching process itself has only rarely been captured on film. These are newly hatched platypus young, filmed in their mother's burrow. They're only about the size of jelly beans. The early mammals must have laid eggs in the same way, and they inherited this trait from their reptile ancestors. This is a view inside a reptile egg. The embryo feeds on a supply of highly nutritious yolk. By the time reptiles hatch, they're sufficiently well developed to go looking for their own food. But the platypus and the echidna are very different. Their smaller eggs contain only a small amount of yolk, so their young hatch in a far less developed state. They need a lot more nourishment if they're going to grow and survive. But at Healesville Sanctuary near Melbourne, we can find delightful evidence that platypus young do develop with great success without having to leave their mother's burrow. Four months after it hatched, a youngster is emerging for the first time. It has grown from a tiny hatchling to near adult size. And that is thanks to an amazing form of nourishment that is a defining feature of all mammals. Milk. This rich mixture of proteins, fats, carbohydrates and minerals oozes from the bellies of female platypus and echidna rather like sweat and provides their young with everything they need to grow. Milk has one key advantage. It's on tap. And that means that none need go to waste. But combining egg laying with milk feeding brought a new challenge. A mammal mother could not leave the eggs to hatch by themselves as most reptiles do today. She had to stay with them. So that would be a constraint. This is that we, as mammals, mm -hmm are dependent upon our mothers for that early nutrition, right? And so in some birds, it's the male that actually stays with the offspring and feeds them like um, insects. Um, the male emus, um, the males are the primary caretakers of the offspring, right? But with mammals, the females are kind of destined to be the ones that take care of the offspring because of the production of milk.
It's kind of interesting, males do have mammary glands. They just are never stimulated to produce milk because they never have the right hormone released. You could stimulate them by giving them hormonal supplements though to develop their mammary glands and actually produce milk. There's a hormone called prolactin that we are all capable of producing. So those are the monotremes. The next one, the major group, are the marsupials. And you're probably aware that marsupials are primarily in Australia, as are the monotremes. But they diversified into in Australia, and so we see a diversification. So we have like marsupial mice, right? We have marsupial, or we used to, wolves. Those are extinct. Um, you know, Tasmanian tigers might be something different. Tasmanian devils, we still have those. Although they're having this horrible time with this inherited form of cancer. Um, when they bite each other, this, this cancer, which is just these renegade cells, actually gets transmitted from one bite from one individual to another. So it'd be like you could just get infected with somebody else's cancer cells, and the cancer grows on them. And so they're trying to figure out how to uh, decrease their decline. So we see this diversification. This would be an example of adaptive radiation. So when we look at the organisms that would be analogous, have the same function in North America, for example, we see that we have mice, but they're not marsupials. We see that we have flying squirrels and not sugar gliders. We see that we have placental wolves, not marsupial wolves. We have, um, what would be a Tasmanian devil? We have a wolverine and not Tasmanian devils, right? And so we see that there's this separate adapt adaptive radiation that took place in Australia because it was separated. It, the continental drift is separated, and then we got all this diversity. Yeah, so koala bears would be. Yeah. Maybe it's because it's warmer there that they can do that? The koala bears in particular? Yeah, or just marsupials. Are marsupials? Well, we saw that we see the diversification elsewhere, but we don't have marsupials. We have placentals, mammals. Do you think that's because? Um, I just think there's the marsupials and the placental mammals took a dramatically different path, and so they um, became isolated. The marsupials became isolated in Australia, so they didn't have to compete with the placental mammals, and so that's why we see the diversification. In New Zealand, it was completely birds. So we didn't have any mammals, but you see that there used to be these huge eagles that were kind of probably had the same function as a marsupial wolf, right? And you see that there was kiwi birds that kind of look like uh, rodents. They're nocturnal and they have feathers that look like hair. And so we see diversification of birds in New Zealand <laughs> like diversification of marsupials in Australia. Okay, so this is just a different reproductive strategy. So what we do have is a short gestation. So that's the time that the, um, that the embryo is inside of the mother. And that's because they do not have a placenta, but they give birth to live um, offspring. So they give birth to underdeveloped, what we would consider even for mammalian standards underdeveloped offspring. And I'll show you a video of this in a second. These offspring attach to nipples in the pouch. Most of them have pouches, not all of them do. So this is where we see the evolution of nipples and grow, right? So this would be a long lactation period. The one marsupial that we do have in North America is what? 
You see it in Pendleton. The opossum. So the opossum is a, how do you spell? I never can spell opossum, right? O-P-P-O, -P -P -O. is there a double S or double P? It's double S, so opossum. So the op opossum is a marsupial, but it lacks a pouch. So um, what this means in terms of like kangaroos, you might have heard that because they've eliminated a lot of the predators, the kangaroo population is expanding just like our deer population. So kangaroo and deer kind of serve the same ecological niche. And in, I think in Wyoming, I, mean, I think there is a, they're actually releasing kangaroos for people to hunt. But anyway, so the, the kangaroos have, ex, have kind of gotten um, expanded their population. And this is because they can have one embryo in gestation, and then they can have one joey in the pouch, and then they can have one offspring outside. And so they kind of have three offspring at any given time at different stages of development. So if that embryo that's short gestation, if it dies, then they can start another one really quickly. And then they, if the one in the pouch dies, then there's one ready to take its place, right? So it's kind of a, um, a strategy to speed up reproduction because you can always have like three different um, three different offspring at any given time. Okay, so let's look at kangaroo birth. As the millions of years passed, Australia began to dry out. The rainforests retreated and were replaced by grassy plains. And as the landscape changed, so did the marsupial mammals. They thrived and diversified into many different species, and they're still abundant today. They differ from the platypus and the echidna in the way they reproduce. Instead of laying eggs, they produce young without protective shells, and this grey kangaroo is about to do so. Out comes not a shelled egg, but a tiny, underdeveloped little worm. less than a lump of sugar. It has no back legs, but it has four legs, and they are just strong enough to pull it through its mother's fur. It started on an extraordinary journey. To survive, it must get to a pouch higher up on its mother's belly. So it is instinctively knows to go up. particle climbs upwards against the pull of gravity and towards the smell of the pouch. After about three minutes, it reaches the lip of the pouch and clambers down to safety inside. There, it clamps its tiny mouth on its mother's nipple and takes its first meal of milk. As it grows, the ingredients of the milk coming from the nipple change to ensure that the infant gets exactly the nutrients it needs for each stage of its development. By the time it's nine months old, it's getting a bit cramped. It's time to enter the outside world. It's almost like a second birth. He's a little unsteady at first, but mum offers a helping hand. He's known as a joey.
It's all a bit much for one day, and he heads back to the safety and security of mother's pouch. It will be another year before he's fully independent. Okay. So I always like to say that is the way to give birth. <laughs> because that is so much easier than giving birth the way that we do. Okay. So then we have the placental mammals. We are a placental mammal. Right? We are still an amniote. We still have an amniotic membrane where we develop, right? But now we have a placenta. So the placenta is a connection between the circulatory system of the mother and the developing fetus. So the umbilical cord is actually fetal and it comes out and it carries the fetal blood to the place where the exchange is. So it gets oxygen, it gets rid of carbon dioxide, it gets nutrients, it gets rid of some waste products, right? And so there are some things that can cross across the placenta. We used to think of the placenta as a barrier, a complete barrier between the mother and the offspring. But now we know that some things, some drugs can get through, alcohol can cross the placenta, um, HIV, the virus, can cross the placenta. So if you're, if you're HIV positive, you could um, give birth to a baby who is also HIV. And then fetal cells can actually go the other way. So they can actually get from the fetus and into the mother and circulate in her body. And they can last a long time, those fetal stem cells in the maternal body. So this means that they have a longer gestation than marsupials. So their offspring are born more developed. Oops, offspring. Although some are more developed than others. So if you think of like the difference between a horse and a bear, the bear um, offspring are much less developed than say for example, a horse offspring. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there for today and we are gonna start talking about anatomy and physiology on Monday. And we're going to start with homeostasis, but then we're going to move to the digestive system. So that will be the last topic before the midterm exam.